Thank you. All right. So, am I? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Whoa. Um, so I'm gonna just talk through my perspective as the um, I'm one of the PIs of the coordinating center. And so I'm just gonna walk through the questions kind of one by one. Um, so. I think we should catalog and evaluate the existing training across the UDN. This has not been a primary focus of ours heretofore. Um, and then we can identify what would be best pursued at the network level. I had a, a very in-depth conversation, thanks to David Adams bringing me up to speed on the many activities at the UDP, and I think those do deserve um, um, an intentional assessment. Um, and we should identify gaps in the, in the current training. Um, so our current training is, is focused on, you know, on clinicians primarily, on researchers, but we may need to educate a broader range of people if we're to disseminate this model, which I think many of us represents the, the future of medicine, for instance, hospital administrators. And uh, just an article came out recently um, about basic science researchers not knowing how to speak to patients and, and preparing them to have those interactions, which will certainly increase over time. So currently we have the UDP has nine distinct training activities, fellowships, genome school, clinical rounds. Several other sites also have training components, and we are planning to create CME, um, CME courses. Um, so as I said previously, we should review um, what we're doing and see what works and what doesn't. As David Adams pointed out, we need to have data sets and materials that can be used for training so that we have, we have material to work on um, to, to, to educate people. And, um, and David also pointed out that we should not underestimate the, the power of direct outreach, like site visits of either people coming in or us going out in order to um, disseminate what, what good the UD, UDN brings. So this is um, just a quote from the two Matts. Matt Might is, is our patient and family advisor at the coordinating center. He's urging us to collaborate and share. Share everywhere. Share early. Share often. And so this is something that really does drive us. We should certainly continue to share data with dbGaP, and, and we will. Um, and as mentioned before, we share with Phenome Central, which is based out of, out of Toronto um, and the, the Sick Kids Hospital, and um, brings us into Matchmaker Exchange. And we certainly should continue to do that because that's where we're going to find matching cases, second cases, third cases. Um, finally, something that I think we need to do more of is share more information via the internet. And Matt Might has been instrumental in emphasizing the importance of this. When I talked to him about where we need to share data, um, you know, we went through dbGaP, Phenome Central, and he said, well, how about Wikipedia? That's where a lot of people get their information. So um, I think we should intentionally do this more often. So we share data with a, a variety of sources, and we have just started a patient web pages project where an unsolved case or a case with a rare diagnosis where they're looking to find a community, we create a web page, do search engine optimization, and help them find, uh, find their community. And Matt Might has had great success with that, and so we're, we're drawing upon his expertise to do that. And we have a number of patients who are interested. Um, so we need to have expanded curation, because we're not just talking about data sharing. We want to share high-quality data. And as Bill mentioned, the, the um, cataloging of human phenotype ontology terms and phenotypes is, is no small undertaking, and it's not typical um, clinical care. So that's something, I think, where we need to um, continue to be vigilant and expand our ability to be vigilant. Um, and we should um, make sharing with the Internet uh, part of our, our practice. Collaboration. All right. So we see the value, certainly, of partnering with, with other undiagnosed diseases clinics uh, around the country. And a lot of that, I think, has been happening through the UDN International, oddly enough, where we come together and, and speak. Um, but it, we should integrate some of that into our, into our you know, business as usual at the UDN. And I, th I don't think we've done that heretofore. Um, so we should proactively build collaborations with extra UDN researchers. As um, many have mentioned, there's a huge network of researchers out there, and finding them is tough for patients. It's tough for us, too. But we need to devote um, time and energy to find, these, um, to find these researchers, to pair them with patients, such that the transition after their UDN visit um, is fruitful and generates the kind of scientific knowledge that, that this network promises to do. Um, and there are all these projects across, uh, also funded by NIH, that, that may be relevant to us. And uh, thank you, thank you, John. And up until this point, we haven't 
actively been working together. I think, you know, as a UDN, it's fair to say we've been focused on getting up and running, and I think now is a time for us to look outward and build bridges such that we can reduce the redundancy and, and learn, learn from these other projects and potentially work on cases together. Um, so, and kind of as I alluded to before, the collaborations aren't just um, biomedical, and as a number of people have said, there's the research clinical distinction, which is a sort of an ethical um, question, implications for payers, implications for how you run your clinics, and, and those kind of collaborations would be, would be helpful to have too. So um, we're currently participating in UDN International, and we're accepting applications for international collaborative clinical sites. You can find the application on our website. Um, R21s and supplements are being uh, given out to explore gene function. They're sort of impromptu collaborations focused on specific UDN case cases. I know this guy who's good at this. I think I'll match his patient up with that person. And that's, of course, expanded with the network. And the UDN is being studied by um, sociologists based at UCLA. So yes, they, they observe our, our activities and will come back to us someday telling us uh, what we're like. Um, so um, should we be more international? It makes sense to have a forum to share these practices. And, and most of all, I think, to encourage data sharing at a global level. Um, and what level of support should they have, should collaborations have? I think they should have more support than they do now because uh, as in talking to David Adams, they do take a lot of effort to maintain these collaborations outside of the UDN and make sure that the information comes back into the UDN. And so with that, I'll thank the members of the UDN, David Adams, the people who created this slide template, and you for listening. <laughs>